Welcome, everybody. So thank you all for being here. It's a little intimidating being in a gigantic room this size. Um, uh, how many of you uh, saw this or uh, last year when I was here? Any of you see this? See what I presented last year? Uh, fantastic. Um, so I'm going to be talking, my name is Kevin McAllister, and I'm going to be talking about FileMaker vertical businesses. So this talk is more about business than about FileMaker. Um, I have been, um, that's, that's more my specialty in the last few years. Um, how many of you have vertical FileMaker businesses? Okay. How many of you want to have a file make, vertical FileMaker business that don't? Okay. Fantastic. So I've been coming to DevCon here now for about 17 years, um, and what I've found is they don't talk a lot about business. They talk a lot about FileMaker. So it's, it's, I, I want to thank FileMaker for really providing what I hope is, is an increasing forum in talking about what we all need to do, which is to make money doing FileMaker. We all know FileMaker is fun, but ultimately we want, to, we want to make money at it. So I want to talk a little bit about succeeding in a FileMaker business. <coughs> so who am I? Um, I'm Kevin McAllister. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called In Resonance. Um, I started doing FileMaker back in 1992 by myself as a, as a single consultant um, and then founded the company in 99. Um, and uh, unbeknownst to this talk, when I put it in, I actually exited um, last Tuesday, um, July of uh, July 18th. So I'm the former, as, as now I have a complete total thing of X's, um, so I am the ex-president and CEO of In Resonance. Um, before that, I was an independent school teacher, and I was the IT director at a very large independent school called the Loomis Chafee School in Windsor, Connecticut. Um, I'm an ex-Peace Corps volunteer, lived for three years, two and a half years in, in, uh, in Paraguay, in, uh, in South America. I'm an ex-exploration geologist and worked for Exxon and Conoco and, and looked for uranium and gold around the world. Um, but my main passion, or one of my passions, is, is travel, and it really is people, languages. Um, I've been in all 50 states. I've been in about 50 countries. Um, and last year, and I'll show you some of this, um, I was able to do what's called the Camino de Santiago, which is a 500-mile walk that starts in France and goes across Spain um, for a couple months. Um, so all of that is an intro to myself as a business person and not so much as a, uh, as a programmer. Um, so who are we to kind of give you a feeling for what In Resonance is? In Resonance, as I said, was founded in 1992. We specialize in what we call open, customizable FileMaker solutions for schools and nonprofits. So we do mostly administrative software. Um, we're, we're in about, um, as it says, we've served about 600 plus schools. We have about 400 or so schools in uh, 36 countries uh, in most of the continents. Um, we have about a 95% retention ratio, uh, over 60 employees. Um, and more importantly to the talk here is that our revenues is in excess of 5 million and we've got about 80% of that, or, or depending on how you count it, is renewable, which to my mind is, is to some degree the, the secret to our, uh, our longevity. Um, so this is where most of us started. Um, We've built this very, very cool app. Or as a custom person, we've now built the same app four or five times. And, the, con and the, the concept is, if I could just generalize this, if I could just, um, I could stop endlessly looking for custom jobs, ultimately, um, I'd be able to, to turn this great widget that I've built into, um, into a, a business and replace my current income and get rich, of course. Um, so the reality and why we're here is that I'm, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to play devil's advocate, which is to say that the second thing, which is the odds are against you. But the first thing is that it's the most exciting thing you can do. And so for me, I feel like that's, that's been the journey I've been on and why I sort of cheerlead for and I do everything I can. I work with a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs in, in, in various um, fields. To, to talk about you know, the excitement and the challenge of, of, of starting and running a company, even though the odds are against you. So because my feeling is that um, it, it really is a great challenge. So I wanted to, wanted to sort of show you my challenge. Last August, right after I left DevCon, this is, you can see my face. Those are luckily kilometers and not miles, but that's the walk, which is 790 kilometers starting from the French border. And that actually, just giving you sort of a, 
That actually started by walking 17 miles, 3,600 feet in 90 degree weather over the Pyrenees just to get to the beginning point of the 790. So the question is, why do we do this journey? And I think part of that is to talk about the reality, even though we're on a really, really exciting um, journey. So let's look at the reality. And as I said, I'm gonna play devil's advocate, which is to talk about how hard it is to run a business knowing that we're gonna do it anyway. As, as most people know, 50% of all small businesses are fail in the first year. And of those that succeed, 50% of those fail in the second year. So that's pretty daunting odds. The second, the third thing is that, is that employees, which is where we all wanna to get to, and, and I can't believe that we're at 60 employees, um, are a lot more expensive than just their salary. And so that has to be factored in that it's more than just simply calculating their salary. Um, and the other is that as you grow, and I'll talk about this along the way, what's almost more important is the cultivation of the culture. It's one thing to work for yourself or work with a partner. It's another to create uh, an atmosphere of 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 people and to create this kind of creative atmosphere. And that's actually part of the challenge, but also part of the fun. Um, and what I've learned through the years is that luckily it's not related to your FileMaker chops because mine aren't that sharp anymore. Um, uh, you know, I started in 92. I probably haven't been, been doing anything creative in FileMaker since about 13, uh, but, I started in, but I started in two. So with that as a, as a basis, to me, the problem when I talk to young entrepreneurs or I talk to any entrepreneurs is that the basic problem is math and it's actually arithmetic. And that is, as I put on here, if we say, I wanna replace my $70,000 salary and pick any other number you have, and I'm gonna sell a widget that costs $1,000, quick math tells me I gotta sell 70 of them. But not only do I have to sell 70 of them, which is more than one a week, I have to sell it, install it, bill it, and get the money in order to get to that 70,000. That's the super easy but super elusive thing that most people don't get when they start doing the math, which is, which is I'm gonna need to sell a lot of stuff to get to 70,000. Most people say, well, this thing is so cool, everybody loves it, everybody's gonna buy it, this will be a killer. How much are you selling it for? 100 bucks. Okay, so do the math. <laughs> That's the thing I always say to people, which is do the math. Um, so if we talk about, if you start to do the math again and you say, okay, I, I hope in two years, three years to have five employees. And I start to do the math and you think about what a, what a typical employee would be. And I'm just saying is that with five employees, you're probably looking at 500K minimum between the salaries, your infrastructure, software, et cetera, et cetera. So now you start doing the math at 1,000 a unit, you're talking about 500 units to basically break even. That's 10 a week, that's two a day. Sold, installed, billed, and paid. So that's serious, that's serious um, uh, commitment in terms of being able to just break even. So again, I'm playing devil's advocate here. So the question for most people as they start this business is how am I going to fund this for the first two years? Because probably in the first two years, I'm not gonna reach that, which means I'm gonna lose some amount of money. So for most people, there's four ways to deal with this. One is be independently wealthy or be married to somebody who's independently wealthy. That's a good thing. Or be married to a spouse that has a great job that's already, that, so that this becomes a game. The other is bootstrap, which is what I did, which is basically make enough money each week to not go under and keep it going year after year and month after month. The other is get investors, and that gets complicated, and it also means you lose uh, both control and often a lot of your profit. Or lastly, create some kind of partnership with your, with your, with your employees or with, with other partners, and those have their own risks. But it's useful to go into this knowing one of those four I'm gonna have to pick up um, in order to sort of take this risk. So to, a couple of things that I learned along the way is that 
it's crucial that your clients not be a burden, but that actually become a source of revenue. So for a lot of people that are beginning or that are programmers, the concept is this thing is so cool, I'm gonna give people free upgrades and I'm gonna give them free support for life. That is probably a recipe for bankruptcy. And the reason I say that is if you start thinking about it, if I get 100 clients and those clients need an hour a month from me, do the math. That's 100 hours a month. That's essentially all my time with zero income. So that's the problem is then if I get 200 clients, now I'm dead. So if, unless the equation gets turned around that a client is actually money versus client is, is stopping me, I'm gonna have a real problem in terms of surviving. And I think that's a hard thing for a lot of people. They just, they don't get that. They wanna say, I will, I will give people, I love it. I love people calling me and asking me questions. I love to talk about this, pro, this project, et cetera. Um, that's really problematic from a business point of view. Um, so from my point of view and where we were able to succeed was that every single client, once we figured this equation out, was a source of renewable income. They were a source, we got income from, every, from their support, we get income from their additional work, and we got income from upselling to those clients because they're already in our network. So it's crucial that your clients are a source of income and not a burden. This doesn't show where we started in 99. It starts when we, uh, around in 2009. And just like Apple, we, I can't show you the real numbers. Um, no, I, I, um, so, but the, the interesting thing here is that if you look at the blue, which is basically my new product sales year in and year out, it, the story for us is that it hasn't changed over time. We sell about the same amount, put in about the same amount year in and year out. But the secret has been that the renewable licenses now dwarf the, uh, the amount of money that we make in new sales. So when we hit 08, 09, 010, 010 um, and, and business stopped, we were okay because our licenses continued right through that. And the second is that our percentage of revenue that comes from support and from customization of our existing clients also grew. So the whole point of success after years one, two, three, four was that we get our revenue from our licenses and we get our revenue from our current clients. And they, have, they became the sustaining part of the company, not the burden. So this is, this is a breakup of that. And this just shows you that over time, when, when we started, it, I sort of did a company reboot in about two, two, 2007, 2008, and we rethought through our licensing scheme and our support scheme. And it really changed the nature of our company, which sort of had stayed at about seven or eight or nine, and then quickly began to go 10, 18, 20, 30, 35. And part of that was, if you look at 2009, we were charging essentially nothing. We were giving support away. And when we basically said, let's stop doing that, we made a huge shift. And as you can see, when we went from 2015 to 2016, we had a company-wide, basically, mandate, which was bill fairly. Because even then, we became to, began to get lax where my support team would say, you know, this was just a quick question. It was just a quick thing. I don't want to bill them for this and for that. And when we sort of tightened that up, the revenue almost doubled. And the clients never said a word. So the crazy thing is they don't mind paying fairly if they're getting good support and they like the product. Sometimes people are afraid to charge for support. But if the people like your product and they like your support, they ought to be willing to pay for it. And that's what we noticed, which was that our revenue was able to go up dramatically, and the support teams and the customization teams were not just a burden, they were actually a major source of revenue for the company. So this is the hard part for most, uh, for most companies, which is <coughs> you're probably going to lose money in the first year depending on, on whether you're one person or two people or five people. And the question is, how much are you gonna lose? So in this case here, I'm saying, I lost 70 grand in year one, and I lost another 100 in year two. So the problem is, how do I survive that? And we talked about the, the, the ways of surviving that before. Um, potentially, you, you've got a line of credit at the bank. Potentially, you've got partners. Potentially, you've got some savings. Um, but as you hit the, get into to year three and get in your stride and increase your clients, now we broke even. 
All right, in year four, we made 70 grand, and in year five, we made 100, 140. And what happens is people meet you in year five, and they're like, this is magic, you're printing money. And you have to say, yeah, but my net money <laughs> is 40K, okay? Not, you know, so, so that if you just look at the company in year five, or in Mike's case, in year 17, it looks fantastic, but years one through five are tough years. And so part of it is trying to, is trying to um, keep focused on, on the journey. And again, as you're building up, the, building up your people and making sure that um, you know, your eyes are on the prize and you have what I would consider the, the tools to weather that journey. And I'll show you a couple of things from the Camino. When you think things are worst, and we're walking 18 miles a day for two months. Then we run into three people who are blind and are walking it with seeing eye dogs. And you realize, what am I complaining about? <laughs> how, bad, how bad is my journey when I, look at, when I look at things like that? And you end up saying, okay, I can do this. I can basically walk down that road for eight hours tomorrow and the next day and the next day. The thing to think about during this journey is that cash is king. People talk about this all the time. If you run out of money, you're dead. That's the, that's the hard part is when you go from a job to this, which is in bad times or when, when the, somebody made a dumb decision or they cut things off, you still get paid. You still have your office. You're still doing what you're doing. If you're in your own business and you're not, if you only, and you needed to sell, 70 units and you sold 12, that's a problem. And, and once the cash runs out, the business runs out. And I think that's the thing that is always on the mind of entrepreneurs, which is I've got to solve that problem. You know? um, <coughs> so for me, as we grew, we began to think about employees and it's really important to do the calculation that employees are far more expensive than simply their salary. You know, so you think, well, I can hire you know, a few programmers for, for you know, young programmers for 40K or 35K or something like that. And that's great. You know, or maybe I need to hire some, some, you know, some more experienced programmers at 70 or 80 or 90. You know, whatever the calculation is or however you want to look at that, what's important is you need to multiply by 0.3 to take care of the benefits, et cetera. So somebody that's making 42 is costing you 52, somebody making 100 is costing you 130. So it's really important when you're doing your budgeting to, to remember that, that that kind of a number in order to look realistically at what this is gonna cost you. And that doesn't count their computer and their software and their licenses and their phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important that this does not go up easy. When I started in residence, I was working at a school and I basically created a, 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 an admission system and some of my colleagues at the school showed it to another school. They called me up. They said, you know, let's, um, we'd love to have that. And so for me, it was great because I could simply go and, um, you know, in the weekends and at nights and things like that, sell this to other schools. The problem was that you get this mentality, which is, I'm, well, the other, the other interesting thing is pricing, because people said to me, so how much is it? So I said, you know, I don't know, <laughs> $2,000, you know, whatever. I, I don't know what, you know, so they said, oh, sure. And so the next person, I said, 3000 like, sure. The next person, 5000 sure. So, you know, part of your problem is, what's this worth? Um, but I did the calculation in my head, and I said, you know, I'm doing seven schools a year, in my spare time, that's like 50 grand, because I was selling it for seven, that's 50 grand, this is easy. I'll quit, hire another guy, and, if, and I'm just doing this kind of, not even messing around, this will easily be, I could easily sell instead of seven, sell 30, you know, this is easy. What you don't realize is when you bring on the next person and open an office and, 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 and bring on those expenses, basically it, things, things get much more expensive very, very quickly. And it, it was one of those hard lessons that we learned back in 99 and 2000. 
The problem also is that when you go from being a, a, a developer who's basically building stuff that's very cool to a company, you also have to begin to assume real company positions. And that means if you're spending all your time building this cool piece of software and you need to sell 70 of them, meaning one a week, somebody's got to be selling them. The world is not gonna to come to your doorstep. So you almost need a full time, or you're gonna to have to have some way of getting sales out there. Maybe you're angry birds. Maybe the thing is just up on the internet and people will just buy it and, and, and the downloads will, will, just, will just come magically. But for most people, that doesn't happen. So somebody's gotta be doing sales. Somebody's also gotta be doing marketing. Somebody's gotta help the clients put this in. Somebody's gonna to have to support them. Somebody's gonna to have to, and the thing that we always forgot was somebody has to build them. All right. I would get clients that would call me, you know, four months later. They're like, are you ever going to send me a bill? Right. Because you, you don't think about billing. Right. You just you just it's just fun. Um, and, and lastly, and that's the part here is one sixth of what you're doing is building your solution. Once you become a real company too often, when we first start, we're doing 98 percent of the time is development. And we're not thinking about any of this other stuff. And that's the difference between being a developer and being a business person is that if you're not thinking of those other five positions, you're potentially not going to survive, even with the coolest, most amazing app in the world. The other things that are gonna happen when I hit 12 or 15 is now you got an HR department. Now you've got to deal with taxes and laws and labor laws and a crazy employee that tries to sue you and stuff you'd never thought about before um, starts to creep up in a way that becomes real. Um, you're also going to have to start thinking about thinking about the business. And that's really what's interesting is where are we in the business? Where do we fit in this market? You know, who are my competitors? What is my strategy, etc.? It's beyond simply I'm going to make a better version of this. I need to think about what the, how the world sees me and how I'm going to approach the world. So I'm gonna to need to do strategy, have some kind of CEO. The other is I'm gonna actually need to keep good books, pay good taxes, or pay correct taxes anyway. And lastly, the hardest thing is, is operations. All of a sudden, and they talked about this down there, all of a sudden I need IT. I've got, it's not just three guys sitting around with, a lap, with laptops. We've got networks, we've got Amazon services, we've got security, you know, this is a, almost a full-time job of somebody just keeping all of us running. So you begin to think about that, it, that once you become a real company, and that's probably somewhere around 10, you're no longer just a bunch of people sitting around with laptops. The other thing, in addition to math in the beginning, I think is that people don't take a hard look because most of us don't write business plans. None, how, many, how many people here have an MBA, right? Me too. Um, this is my MBA. So that idea of starting this business with a, with a plan and, and understanding your market and all that, that doesn't happen, right? So the question is, as we begin to look at the market, is how many people could buy this, all right? If I've built a very, very cool tool for FileMaker developers, I ought to know how many there are and what percentage of those would buy my app and do the, do the basic math. If I'm doing something in healthcare or something for a, for a fire department or doing something for, for the music business or whatever, hopefully I've got an understanding of how many people could potentially buy this before I start. Just everybody will love this and lots of people will buy it is not a good way to start a business. So the question would be, you know, not only how many potential customers are there, but how many of those customers are looking for something new, better, and would be willing to look at what I've just done. That's important to understand. Who are the competitors in my market? And lastly, how are all these great customers going to find me? You know, if you're doing something, like I say, in, in, in the music business or doing something in healthcare, that's great, except how are all those people going to find you and find that you have this great, this great new tool? So that's, a, that's why the marketing piece comes in. There, there ought to be somebody that understands how to get your message out to the world. Because just because the people here at this conference think you've got the greatest thing they've ever seen, that will not make a business. So these are some challenges to think about. And, and again, this, this slide deck is, is available for you. 
I'm not going to go in one after another after another, but these are just some of the things that I've had to deal with because this is really a quantum leap. So as you go from me to me and my partner, what you got to deal with is who's in charge? Why are you in charge? Which parts are you doing? Which ones am I doing? Which ones am I not doing? Are you doing the billing, um, et cetera? Are you doing the sales? Once you get two to five, now it's I'm the boss, you're the employee. And that's something that has to get established. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be ugly, but it has to exist, all right? For whatever, what, you know, regardless of the fact that we're all really good friends, you work for me. I have to pay you. I get your paycheck to you. So that's a hard thing to begin to establish as you grow is, is this concept of some of us are employees and some of us are owners. When you move five to 10, all of a sudden, everybody can't do everything. When I started, I was a salesperson. I was the developer. I was the marketing. I was the installer. I was the biller, everything. Now I have to have development team. Now I have to have a support team. Now I have to have, and I have to let them do development in a way that drives me crazy. That's the hardest thing as an owner is to say, that's not how I do that, but it's good. Um, you know, that's not how I'd sell that. That's not how I'd demo that. That's not how I would support that, but, you know, right on. And that's hard. So that's the next piece you come to when you hit those kinds of numbers of about five to 10 as you begin to break into teams and you have to let go. And that's really hard if you're the founder, creator of this product and it's your baby. Um, as I said, when you get to 10 to 15, now you're dealing, with, as I, you're dealing with infrastructure. Now we've got probably an office. Even if we're virtual, we're going to have to connect. We're going to need help ticketing system. We're going to need some kind of billing system. We're going to need uh, probably a website. We're going to need some way to connect, maybe Slack, et cetera, et cetera. And so somebody's got to set that up. Somebody's got to get it running. And that may be half of a job. So it begins to get a little more problematic when you get there. 25 to 50. All of a sudden, we sell in 36 countries in probably 35 states, and I have employees in about 10 states. There is a lot of paperwork. There is a lot of regulations. There's a lot of things you got to file in terms of all those employees and all those places and all those customers and et cetera, et cetera. And that's a lot. So that's the next piece you end up with, which is my, my, you know, my suggestion in what I did from, from day one was I found an incredible accountant who was outside my company, but he's rode with me the whole way and really been my right arm. Without him, I certainly wouldn't have survived because there's just so many things that you'll never know about in terms of all of that. But it's really important to understand that, um, that you're gonna have to deal with that. You're now a real company and there are, there are real laws in terms of, in terms of everything from sales tax um, and employees and compensation, et cetera, et cetera, that are, that are in incredibly important as you become a real company. And once you hit 50, you have things like succession, which, which I just did. Um, potentially, because the losses and the gains get, the, the curve gets much higher, you may need to look at funding because uh, what I found was I was at the limit of being able to sustain you know, uh, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of loss in order. In, you know, I work in the school business, which is incredibly cyclic. So you do massive amounts of business May through October, and then you're sort of asleep. It's kind of like it's kind of like owning a vacation home. You know, from from January through through March, and so payroll unfortunately doesn't stop during that. So you end up with your cash doing this, and um, even though you're profitable at the end of the year. It's a, it's, it's a roller coaster ride every year because, because the employees will not, not get paid in, February, in January, February, and March, uh, even though you don't have a lot of money coming in. So that's something you, that you need to think about. The reason that I kept going and the reason I bring this in is the thing that made the journey on the, on the Camino really fun, and I think the same thing with our companies. I have 50 employees and universally know all of them, is the company that you're with. That's what really, to me, while, while we're dealing with the risk, it's the people you, that you work with and you're in day in, day out, and the people you run across on a daily basis. Some crazy Spaniards that we, that we ran, ran across at one point. Um, that, to me, is as important as the money piece. And I talked about that in the beginning, which is creating your culture and sustaining that culture is as important as dealing with the bottom line. 
And in resonance, we have, our, our basic principles are that our job is to empower dedicated professionals. That's, while I work in education software, that's my point. That's what we do. We empower dedicated professionals. And that underwrites everything we do. And I have two, we have two mantras in terms of what the company's all about, and that is to acquire and, and retain quality employees. And what I often say to people is, to me, the greatest thing that we accomplished as in residence is I put, I put food on the table for 50 families. That, to me, is a product. And the second is that we, we acquire and retain quality clients. And that was the other piece. That's why we have 95% retention is that we basically, to, to, to our company, these are friends. These are, these are not customers, these are friends. These are people that we wanna know personally. These are people that we will deal with uh, in, in very much in, in an honest way. And I guess so, for me, the, the, the piece that was really important was that every single day we dealt honestly and we dealt fairly with everybody. And the opposite of that, which I did, was two or three times over the course of the 17 years, we had a client, and I'm sure you guys run into these, who was just impossible, was just nasty. They were nasty contracting, they were nasty to my employees, they were nasty all the way around. And in three occasions, I simply called the person up who was in charge of that school or whatever, and I said, here's your money, every dime, we're done. I didn't ask for the deposit, I didn't ask for our expenses, I just said, we're done. And that was so important to my employees, that message, which is, folks, you know, we're not going to let these people treat us and be that way. It's just money. And over time, I think that helped our, relate, that helped our reputation in the market to say, we love you guys, but there's a limit. And I think that's really crucial as you build the company that you want and figure out how you want to deal with your employees and how you want to deal with your, with your clients is that is, from, from my point of view, is honesty and, 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 and integrity. So coming around the full, full circle, <coughs> FileMaker, building in the FileMaker market, I think is, has a lot of it, has a lot of good points. And I started with FileMaker in 92. I was a CSA member in, in 1992 before FileMaker 3. And the same things that were true then are many of the same things that were true then are true now. And the first one, which they talked about at the keynote, is rapid development. The fact that in this world and at this point, that the needs are identified and somebody's gonna get into a niche quickly. And once you've established yourself in that niche, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna own that niche. And FileMaker allows us to do what you can't do in, in, in other platforms where they may you know, identify a need, but if you've got a 24 or 30 month development cycle, by the time you get there, that market's gone. And I think that is the huge advantage, especially in the iOS thing here, is that, is that if you can identify a need, whether it's organizing dog walkers or it's a fire department or whatever, and you can get that app out and get it to market and begin to to uh, begin to, to, to capture that market share, you can do that in months with FileMaker because the most important piece of, that I've learned over time with software is the mantra, ready, shoot, aim. You know, that's what people talk about. If you wait until your app is perfect, you'll be dead. So you have to get out a good app, get people to buy it, and fix it. And that's so crucial in the software business, you will never put out the app you wish you had. You need to put out the app that works well enough for people to say, this is great, I've got a few suggestions, and that's great, because thank you. That now, that now creates a group of people who like what you're doing and are also helping you. And so that's, that is, the, to me, the thing about FileMaker that's so compelling, especially with the new stuff that's coming out, is that we can go from idea to a product and have it out there in months and not in years. The other is that we are connected to Apple. And I think that, that while there is the Android market and, and you know, that's, that, is a, you know, that, that is a problematic thing to some degree, 
I think because of WebDirect, I think because of all those other things, and certainly with, with Amazon, that our ability to reach customers in a variety of ways in a variety of places is, is, is not available in other markets. We have schools in Bangladesh, we have schools in Burkina Faso, we have schools in uh, Pakistan, and they don't have uh, the kind of internet that would support a web, uh, that would support a, a SaaS product. So our advantage in those markets is that, and in Guatemala and in, and in the Dominican Republic and many other places we're in, is we actually still have client server. So that's great is that we can't, and yet, yet when we're in Japan or we're in Singapore or we're in Beijing, you know, these people have gigabytes to the desktop. So the beautiful thing about FileMaker is you've got choices. You can be Amazon or you can be client server, you can be web direct or you can be mobile and you can do all of those without major engineering changes. And I think that's huge for all of us that are trying to figure out how we, how we find our place in the market. Um, and the other is that obviously, as they showed in the beginning, that people want mobile. Um, and the, the, the tools that they've given us here really, really bring us to that place. Um, so trying to sum this up, and I will then go to questions, and they've asked me to make sure that people come up to the microphone to ask the questions, is when people are looking at vertical apps or looking at, at beginning their own company, what I, my, my suggestions or my, my um, is are threefold. One is that do the math in terms of your revenue um, and in terms of your market numbers, so that you're not you're not walking blind into a, into a situation in which it's already hopeless before you start. Um, secondarily, be realistic about your first two years funding. That if you're bootstrapping it, realize how risky that is. If you have no savings. If you have no source of funding, if you don't have at least a line of credit at the bank or something, you could get in trouble, which is why 50% of the companies fail in the first year. You could get in trouble six months down the road and you need to go into it with your eyes wide open that potentially you're gonna need some kind of a, of a cash buffer for a couple of years. Um, and lastly, all those things I talked about, which is as you go from one to two and two to five and five to 10, there are known structural growth challenges, and I would say read everything you can in all kinds of those books about teams and about leadership. I mean, there's just so many things to read and think about. Um, because the success, again, is not about how good your app is. We're assuming people wrote a good app. The, 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 the success will be you've got enough cash to survive, you bring in good employees, you, you understand your market, and you diversify enough to get that product out into people's hands. Um, so one of the things that, um, and so with that, I guess what I would say is um, what they talk about on the thing, which is buen camino, which means have a great journey. So thank you. So um, there will not be updates if uh, we have time, I believe we have time, yes, for, um, for questions. So if people, if people uh, have questions, want to, can you uh, come up to the mic? Because this is being recorded. Is anybody? Yes, no? Yeah, OK. And you can line up behind him if you want. Please. Um, how much pushback did you get over the years from clients not being comfortable with, with the FileMaker you know, server client model versus SaaS model? Great, great question. I, I think that the pushback has increased over the last five years. Um, and it, I think that um, FileMaker has answered that to some degree with the, with the FileMaker cloud solution. But absolutely, um, I think the big pushback you, that, that I have found or we found from FileMaker is one, people who are ignorant about FileMaker and you know, say, isn't that some kind of toy that works on a Mac that they, you know, for, for like, records or contacts or something that's and and the other is is client server but as i said i think we've with with the help of filemaker and we've certainly used some of their se's and we've used some of their people to come in on demos and you know we know that the the answers are strong depending on depending on your market share i mean depending on your mark what market you're in 
that there are answers in terms of the success of FileMaker and FileMaker being part of Apple and, and, you know, and the widespread use of FileMaker, et cetera. But absolutely, I think that that piece, which is FileMaker's dead, right, because it's client server, the world has moved SaaS, you know, what, what are you guys doing, is, is certainly out there. But I believe we have answers. Yes? Um, in your case, I think you had a product that you already had built to, and, and then you were selling it to other things. If you're building a product and you're not quite sure what the market looks like, are there resources or uh, ways that you would suggest to um, you know, kind of verify that you have a market? It's a good question, and I think the, the only thing I would say is I think it, the problem is there's so many markets um, that that's it, that, is, that is the greatest challenge. I don't know what the resources would be because I don't know what, what markets you're looking in, um, but I think I would just reverse that question or, or sort of reverse that and say, I think figuring that out before you take the leap is crucial. You know, how many clients are, how many customers potentially are there? What are my competitors? How am I gonna reach these people? And do I have answers to that? Because if I don't, I don't wanna jump off the cliff yet. Yes? On a, on a technical note, uh, how did you handle versioning for 600 deployments? Great question. That is one of the things that has been um, both a blessing and a curse of being a FileMaker company through the years. Um, and certainly FileMaker's working on that now in terms of, in terms of, of newer ways of, of bringing in updates, et cetera. For us, what happened was we said to the schools, because we also sell our products open and we sell them with the full passwords to our clients. Um, so a lot of people said that's insane, but, but we've done that and we've successfully done that not, and I wouldn't recommend that in every, in every case, especially with financial software. Um, but getting to the answer was we basically assumed that clients would re-up about every three to five years. And so for us, what we said to clients was in three to five years, we will have version X plus one and it's not, there's no push button. It is a matter of you thinking about what it currently does, looking at what you added to it, because they would have added reports, they would have changed stuff, et cetera. You, you get the new version for free, and we will do the labor to, to bring that up, to move your data in and bring it up to whatever it needs. And that's gonna have to be done manually. We're gonna need to move the scripts in, we're gonna need to move the layouts in, we're gonna need to move the fields in. But in general, that's not so bad, but that's probably two or three days work. So from my point of view, that's $1,500 worth of, worth of revenue. So, with that, so again, that goes back to my model, which was while it seems like a problem because they can't update and, and have it be seamless, in fact, from the company's point of view, if I multiply that out, that was five or $600,000 worth of revenue every year, upgrading, as we called it upgrading, our clients who then stayed with us. So to my mind, I turned what I hope was lemons into lemonade, yes. In that second year, when you were 170 grand upside down, what did you see or experience that made you continue into the third year? Well, that wasn't real. That was a, that was I, I made that up. Um, but maybe maybe um, maybe naivete, <laughs> maybe determination. Um, I, I think that because we ran we ran actually with a loss for about the first three to four years. Um, we, had, we had bank loans, um, and we also had uh, ultimately took in, which was unsuccessful, took in a little bit of investment. Um, but I think it's, to my mind, it was the feeling that this will turn around, that this is a good market, this is a good product, there is good interest, I have great people, and this is worth doing. Um, but yeah, I, you know, we certainly went for, three or four years where I would sometimes delay my paycheck by a couple days or not take a paycheck for a, one time because, you know, <laughs> that's what happens. But ultimately, you know, it came up and, and, and took off. But, that, but you're right, it's faith. And to me, it's, it's, it's like the journey. It's, it's I, I believe this will happen and I'm going to keep at it. So you outlined the different sizes of organizations and the different challenges you face along the way. 
Was there a certain point along that spectrum when you really felt the momentum increase? Was there a, a tipping point, so to speak, when you've been able to segregate duties and just the pace of everything picked up? Yes, and actually, in looking at other companies around here, it was actually sort of two stories, that I founded the company with another partner and, and brought on a, a financial partner, and so from 99 to 2005, we were basically maybe you know losing a little bit of money or basically break even, and, and we were not charging for support, we were not charging licenses, we were just trying to do essentially sell it out. I had a difference of opinion with those people and they all left. So at that point, the company rebooted in 2000, at the end of 2007. And, and so the, what we found was by changing that model, by charging the licenses, by raising the, the rates of those licenses, by charging for support, by breaking into teams, we sort of went seven, 12, 20, 35. And we found over the course of, in, 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 and the strange part for us was that was in 08 and 09 and 010, which were, which were terrible years in general um, for, um, for the world, that was where our momentum hit. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely, and I think, I think sort of success begets success, if you will. Um, the other thing that we did in, in, uh, is that while we have those numbers, we actually recognize that some of the challenges that are coming from FileMaker are, um, need to be balanced out, and so we actually have another division that does websites for schools based on open source Drupal. So 10 of our employees are doing that. And the other was we recognize that we're going mobile and we built in a division that's doing, that's doing basically native apps. So we are, we are now 60% FileMaker, 20% uh, Drupal, and 20% um, uh, 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 mobile apps. And so for us, you know, the point is we've got to stay relevant, we've got to stay current. It's not FileMaker or die, but FileMaker is the basis of, of what we do and, the, and certainly the basis of probably 80% of our revenue currently, yes. Is open. How do you then have that conversation to then garner support, and how, how does that conversation take place so that it's not feeling like a bait and switch? Um, that's a great question. So the way we deal with it with our with our schools, and one of the things that's great is I, I work with independent schools, which are fantastic organizations. They're just they're they're good people. In 17 years of worth of worth of work, we have we have $1,100 in bad debt. So that's, that just tells you the kind of people you're dealing with. So, so we're not dealing with, ra with random people. But our point is this, this solution is open. You can customize it, we can customize it. If it breaks, we will help you. If you broke it, you will pay for it. But what we found is that that sounds, you know, in many platforms, that's probably a recipe for insanity. I've not found that in FileMaker. We have never had a school destroy their, their, their solution. We've never had a school destroy all their data. I mean, they've done a few dumb things, but with a backup or whatever, we've never had, in 17 years and in, in 600 deployments around the world, we've never had a disaster. But that's a good question, and that was our, the other thing which, which was our contract, because what we said to schools was, you may do whatever you want with this in terms of adding, in terms of moving on to other modules, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing you can't do is resell it. You don't have the license to resell it, only we do. I don't know whether that's, will that hold up in court, but luckily no one has really challenged that, you know, so that, um, that, that worked for us. I think if I had to do it over again or in this world, I probably would lock it down and maybe have some kind of timeout or something, but we don't, yes. So how have you adapted with the changing FileMaker licensing uh, changes over the years? Bumpily, if that's a word. Um, we are we do we let FileMaker do all the licensing, you know. So we've been down that road of attempting to do SBA and have not through the years. That that um, um, so we simply you know send our customers to the rep in whatever region they're in, and and they deal with it. Um, we have looked at doing more of that online, and things have gotten better, etc. But that's with the different licenses and the different products, etc. You know, I'd say that's been a bumpy journey, but. So you didn't feel that being a one-stop shop was an advantage? Um, we had looked at that, and uh, while we thought it was an advantage, we were never able to, to find that that advantage was more important than the disadvantages uh, that, we, that we had to deal with. 
But yes, sometimes you know, we would lose a sale because people are like, you mean I've got to buy this from you, then I've got to call FileMaker and, and negotiate licenses with them? No. So you're right. I mean, in some cases that, that, is, th that was a detriment, but we felt that it was um, just what we had to, what we had to jump through to, to actually become in the licenses, et cetera. In the early days, and I don't know how many of you how long, you used to have to buy the licenses. And so I'd have to buy twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars worth of licenses, and then own them, and give, and then dole them out over time. And we said, no way, that we're not, we're not going to take on, especially when you're losing money. We're not going to take on that kind of debt burden, um, and own FileMaker licenses, etc. And clearly, the models changed over time. But it was, it was, you know, a number of things like that that we just said, we love FileMaker, and we love the FileMaker reps, and they can sell it, and it, that worked for us because it actually also kept us plugged into the reps in all the divisions and the SEs, et cetera, we had pretty daily, you know, pretty frequent contact with them through the years. But that's a great question. Other questions? Well, if not, thank you so much for coming, and uh, Wayne Camino.